Hello and welcome to a spoiler-free review for The Priory of the Orange Tree. The Priory of the Orange Tree is a standalone fantasy epic written by Samantha Shannon. Epic is no exaggeration, as if you decide to pick up Priory, you'll find it's a little over 800 pages long. I bought the hardcover version, which included a couple world maps, as well as a glossary at the back that briefly covers the major characters, atypical words, and other notable story bits. I must say, I am hard-pressed to remember a better book cover design than Priory. It's simply drop-dead gorgeous. The artist responsible is Ivan Belikov from Moscow, Russia. I'll link to some of his work down below. He's talented to say the least. That being said, is Priory a book you should judge by its cover? Let's find out. The narrative of The Priory of the Orange Tree is divvied up among four separate storytellers. The first character we meet is Tane, a young woman from the east preparing to become a dragon rider. Following that is Eid, a woman in the service of Queen Sabrin, but also tasked to defend her queen in secret, as Eid is also Sub Rosa, a, a priestess of the Orange Tree, and has access to powerful magic. Eid's role in Priory takes up a significant proportion, far more than the other characters. Nicolas Ruse is a disgruntled and exiled alchemist, living out his golden years rather isolated and alone. Through extraordinary circumstances, he is whisked away from his dreadfully humble life and thrown into an adventure. Our final character is Lord Artuloth, a friend of Queen Sabrin and a diplomat. Artuloth is forced to face grave danger while outside the realm of his rather privileged existence. The plot of Priory is pretty straightforward. Multiple religions and beliefs tell of the return of the Nameless One, basically a one-man dragon apocalypse, and the characters have to sort through thousands of years worth of history, legend, and misconceptions in order to figure out how to defeat him. Of course, other obstacles stand in the way, the biggest being long-held grievances between the Eastern and Western worlds, which prevent these characters from meeting or interacting, these grievances mostly stemming from a difference in religion and the fact the East has an affinity for dragons. Other forms of dragons exist in Priory, and occasionally the characters have to confront these dragons, or, in Tane's case, cooperate them. Also, a political plot surfaces surrounding Queen Sabrin, which I found to be a highlight of the story. So, I want to be straightforward and honest with you, I was not impressed by Priory of the Orange Tree. Priory has fantastic reviews on Goodreads and many other review websites. I'm glad so many people enjoyed this epic, but the same enjoyment wasn't there for me. If you'll bear with me, I would like to explain why. First, let's look at characterization. I found both Tane and Artiloth to have very little personality, especially Artiloth. They don't really have any unique quirks or features about themselves, both are very bland and have dry speaking mannerisms, and Artiloth especially contributes very little to the plot. Loth never undergoes a meaningful character arc. Tawny sort of has one, but it doesn't feel well deserved. The Tawny and Artiloth we meet in the first hundred pages of Priory are pretty much the exact same ones that we'll find around the end of the book. Nicolais had the most potential out of all the characters, as he could have been a major antagonistic influence, but his perspective is woefully rare for the second half of the novel, and um, he only really comes back at the end to throw his ten cents into the climax. Eid is who we follow through most of Priory, and I think I enjoyed her perspective the most. Eid is faced with many difficult decisions, and also finds herself in the middle of conflict often. That being said, Eid is a very passive character in the first 400 pages. In fact, a massive problem with these characters overall is that they very rarely do anything out of their own volition. They aren't actively working towards a goal even though they have one, and instead they sit back and wait for something to happen and then react to the situation. Let me give you an example without spoiling too much. You know this book is about dragons and cities by the cover, so this shouldn't ruin, any, ruin anything for you, but there are very minor spoilers ahead, so I'll show you where to skip if you want to avoid them. Let's say that dragons attack a city that the characters are in, the characters react to them and fight them off. After forcing the dragons to flee, the characters know a dragon attack could happen again in the future. This is a fine way to get the plot going. A passive event has called the characters to action, but instead of taking precautions for the next dragon attack, maybe building and living in underground bunkers and tunnels, readying war machines, having war meetings, 
gathering soldiers, building ballistas and other weaponry, stockpiling food and water, sending out scouts and squadrons to attack the dragons, gathering medical supplies, forging alliances, practicing evacuations, training, making speeches to calm frightened citizens, you know, reacting to the situation, the characters decide to practically ignore the fact that a dragon attack actually happened and continue about their business pretty much as normal. One of the characters does make a substantial sacrifice in order to prepare for the Nameless One threat in the future, but her decision will have no impact on stopping other dragons from attacking, nor does her decision prepare a defense against these other dragons. Then the characters run around like headless chickens when the dragons show up again because they're cut off guard because they didn't prepare anything and weren't being cautious. Now, after the second dragon attack, the characters finally get together and decide to do something, but throw a massive party first, because despite the fact that another dragon attack could happen at any moment and kill many important leaders at the party, uh, clearly dancing and drinking and feasting should take precedent. Keep in mind, it's almost reasonable for characters to act like this in Priory of the Orange Tree, because Samantha Shannon doesn't describe the death and destruction the dragon's attack bring upon the city, or the rest of the world for that matter, except for East Gallen. You practically never see or hear about how loved ones were carried off by wyverns, how monuments and homes were reduced to ash and rubble, how innocent people were torched or eaten. You could argue that since the characters experiencing the attack are more or less confined to the Innie's palace court, and that they should miss out on a lot, but surely they would be able to make out the plumes of smoke, the gathering crowds of refugees outside the palace, wyverns in the distance flying off with livestock and people in their clutches. I can only remember a specific instance where Shannon describes the extent of the destruction in Innies, and I wish she included more of that. Because of how little raising happens, the dragons never feel like an actual threat, and the resurrect and the resurrection of the Nameless One honestly feels like something the characters could deal with after sleeping in and having a picnic lunch. One character actually does sleep through the whole thing, go figure. This boils down to the main problem plaguing Priory, which is the fact that it lacks solid and compelling antagonists and thus lacks interesting conflict. As I mentioned before, the Dragons and the Nameless One are always so far away or leave so little impact they hardly qualify as antagonists. Especially in the first 400 to 500 pages of Priory, I was unable to point my finger at a character that is anything more than a low hurdle for the protagonist to hop over and is a serious and constant threat. A good example of this is the bully that Tane encounters during her dragon trials, Tarosa. Whatever conflict that exists between Tane and Tarosa is easily resolved with no character development, and the whole situation has no bearing on the larger plot in any way. Nicolaes had real potential to be an antagonist, and if Shannon had allowed him to engross himself more in treachery, blackmail, and greed for the sake of himself and his work, I think he would have been a fantastic anti-hero or villain in the vein of Walter White from Breaking Bad. If you want concrete examples of why Priory has diluted villains, check out my spoilers discussion. I'll go in more detail there. Many of the action scenes in Priory leave a lot to be desired, and often the action contradicts itself or leaves you questioning why the villains didn't just simply kill the protagonists. The spatial and temporal positions of characters involved in the action is sometimes confusing. Once or twice I was left wondering how a character was so easily able to get to somewhere so quickly. Sometimes Samantha Shannon builds up an action scene and then skips over it by having the eyewitness character go unconscious. In one particular part later in the story, Samantha builds up to conflict between Eid and another character, but simply skips over a potentially intense action scene and simply tells us what happens a couple pages later, summing up the whole thing and telling us about it in a very unimaginative paragraph. It's kind of like watching a western film that ends up skipping the showdowns and instead slaps some text on screen to summarize what happened and how everything ended. It's frustratingly anticlimactic, and the problem is exacerbated by Shannon's extensive world building. With all the lore and ideas presented, readers have a growing expectation of a satisfying payoff during narrative high points, especially with the climax at Priory, but the reward is almost always unremarkable. Now, the selling point for many readers in Priory of the Orange Tree is the inclusion of gay and lesbian romance. 
I've mentioned in previous reviews that I don't often read romance, but I know how it should be incorporated into a story to create conflict. Basically, as an author, you need to stand in the way of what your characters want. Maybe you'll give them a little gift and allow them to accomplish something small, but then you'll rip apart that gift, that gift and take something else away while you're at it. As soon as a character gets what they want, there is no conflict. I think Shannon accomplishes this romantic conflict concept fairly well with Ede and Nicolae's in their respective relationships, but the problem with Ede is that she never seems to express a strong desire to have a relationship. It never really seemed to be her goal. One of the reviews I read on Goodreads asks, "Why does Ede love, or what does Ede love about character X? Is it just love for the sake of love?" And I think it's a good question. After reading Priory, I can't remember why Ede loved character X, except for character X's blind faith and devotion to her cause, which doesn't really seem like Ede, as her character isn't an idealist. In fact, Ede had a very explicit conversation with Trude, where Trude expresses her ideals and blind faith in changing the world, and Ede berates her for being impractical. Unless character X was actually able to drastically change Ede's personality, which wasn't obvious when I read through, then Ede seems to be in love for practically no reason. For Nicolaes, he loved his partner because his partner was one of the few people who understood him and his work as an alchemist. Nicolaes, romantic partner, is also fundamental to Nicolaes' main goal, and I think it's written fairly well, although we see so very little of it. The prose is acceptable in Priory, and I can appreciate many of the ways Samantha chooses to describe elements of her world, food and drink especially. Character dialogue is written with a mix of Old English and Contemporary English, which I personally felt was fine, although many characters are very formal and uptight in how they speak, which leads them to more or less sound the same, bar some privateers and pirates that you can come across. The lore of Priory of the Orange Tree is well planned. It's indisputable that Shannon put a lot of work to develop these various religions and cultures, the mythology and the history. In reviews of Priory, the epic is often compared to the work of Tolkien. However, her implementation of this lore is what falters. I'm not sure if it was a stylistic choice to include interludes where characters explain war to lore to one another. I think Shannon wanted to frame Priory this way to replicate early 20th century fantasy, but it doesn't work very well. It's a trope called As You Know or As You Know Bob, and essentially the story pauses while characters tell each other information that is meant for the reader. There are instances where this trope can be used, but Shannon uses it fairly frequently to info dump her lore on readers. What makes it annoying is that the information is generally useless until the final third of Priory, and uninteresting because it has little if nothing to do with the present. I would rather Shannon had a scene with her characters doing something unique and interesting in the present world that has implications of lore, instead of loafing around and talking about lore that has no relevance to the present. There is one scene in particular where Ede is traveling through a desert, and she meets a random side character who we never see again, who lectures her about lore, and he does this instead of Ede fighting a new type of dragon, or riding through the desert and discovering something to add to the world, or just facing some sort of obstacle, any obstacle. Now, obviously, the element of the characters seeking to find the truth and reconciliation in their religion and culture is how they will defeat the Nameless One. But I'm positive Shannon could have found a way to sprinkle this information into the story in a creative way, without relying so heavy-handedly on the as-you-know trope. As it stands, these sections are a chore to read. The climax of Priory makes up about 20 pages, and considering the epic had nearly 800 pages leading up to it, it is written much too fast and is messily brought together. There are pretty much no surprises, and the antagonists represent very little challenge as they have throughout the rest of Priory. This is all I have to say for the non-spoilers review. Overall, I found Priory to be a rather dull read. Nothing in the story or characters really left an impression on me. There was one good plot twist, a couple good fight scenes, and I liked the political infighting that happens in the latter half, despite it being not set up very eloquently. Other than that, I don't have much of a takeaway. The first 400 pages are below average, where very little happens, and what does happen isn't really that important to the overall plot, 
except for stuff that Sabrin and Eve get up to. Ardiloth and Tane are essentially a contrived plot device delivery service. Their purpose is just to carry around important stuff until it falls into the right hands. Nicolaes is a weak anti-hero and he could have been so much more. The remainder of the book is painfully average, characters actually begin to do something, but they have so few interesting qualities, and without antagonists who actually pose a threat, conflict and tension is basically non-existent, and it was near enough impossible for me to stay engaged with the story. I cannot in good faith recommend you buy Priory of the Orange Tree. If you are really interested in it, I would implore you to borrow it from a library. Check out my spoilers discussion, and have a nice day.